and it will be online. And so we would certainly invite all of you to please come and be a part of that. Well, now turning to the event of tonight, it is my honor and privilege to introduce Susan Park Spencer. Susan is certainly a daughter of Washington County in Prairie Grove, and uh, she's been a very indispensable member of the Washington County Historical Society and helped chair the Out in the County Committee. And we're just so thrilled that we have the opportunity for her to speak on her book at war on, and on the home front and sharing some history of Prairie Grove and her family. And uh, also want to throw out there that Susan is going to be recognized next Sunday as one of our distinguished citizens for Washington County. Without further ado, again, thank you for joining us. Susan, it's all yours and thank you so much for being a part of us tonight. Well, thank you. Um, there were a lot of photos and other items that I would have liked to include in the book, but there just wasn't enough room. So I put some of my favorites in this slideshow to share with you. This was the first house Myrtle's parents, Dr. E.G. McCormick and his wife, Mamie, lived in after they moved to Prairie Grove in 1884. It was torn down around the turn of the century and replaced with the house that's still standing. Myrtle and her mother, Mamie, were in the center getting ready to throw snowballs. This is the McCormick house that replaced the original. Their new house was built in the early 1900s and is still located on the corner of Bush and Mock Streets. Jim and Myrtle were married in 1910 and their house was built sometime around then. This is from 1978, the year Myrtle died, and I think the photo was taken around the time the house was sold. It's still standing on the corner of Neal and Graham Streets. Brothers Frank and Cecil Rigall, who were both physicians, opened the Elizabeth Hospital in 1937. It was built across the street from the entrance to the Battlefield Park. Named after their mother, it had 25 beds and admitted over 23,000 patients until it closed in 1966. The nursery was named after Dr. McCormick and in an article from the Prairie Grove Enterprise, it said they named it in honor of, quote, one of the oldest practicing physicians in the county and one who has brought many babies into the world, end quote. The nursery's metal nameplate is at the Country Doctor Museum over in Lincoln, and Dr. McCormick is included in their Hall of Honor. Here's cousin Mally. I wanted to talk a little bit about her because she had an impressive education and teaching career. In the 1914-1915 edition of the Woman's Who's Who of America, a biographical dictionary of contemporary women of the United States and Canada. It lists all of her academic degrees and where she taught. In 1894, she graduated from the University of Arkansas with a Bachelor of Arts degree. She was a professor of English and German at West Florida Seminary in Tallahassee from 1895 to 1900. In 1900, she received a graduate scholarship from Cornell University in English philology. I had to look that one up, and it's the study of literature and of disciplines relevant to literature or to language as used in literature. She received her master's degree in that in 1901. Between 1906 and 1911, she was an instructor at four different schools. She taught English at the Female Seminary in Tahlequah, Oklahoma, was an instructor in Latin, French, and German at the Alabama Synodical College in Talladega, taught Latin and German at the Business and Normal College in Chillicothe, Missouri, and was an instructor in English and German at the Presbyterian College for Women in Charlotte, North Carolina. She eventually moved back to Prairie Grove and taught at Prairie Grove High School. Cousin Mally's on the front row, seated to the left of that gentleman. The four cousins all graduated in the same class at Prairie Grove, and this photo was taken on the front steps of the McCormick House. This picture was taken four years after the Beverly opened. Arthur McCormick's Texaco garage is on the left and Carmen's drugstore is to the right. The photo may have been taken when they were getting ready to add the marquee and you can see where some of the windows have been opened up in the front. Today, Daisy's and Olives, an antique and flea market store, has their business in all three buildings. When I was going through the letters, I noticed how all of the different military bases had their own logos. In the early years of the war, they mostly started out pretty simple, but as time went on, they became a lot more detailed. These are all from letters mostly sent from Donald in early 1942 when he was at Camp Robinson. And these were on more letters in 1942 from Donald when he was stationed at Fort Meade. 
The one with the bomb is one of my favorites. It looks almost like something out of a cartoon. I think I'd call it more cute than threatening. By 1943, the designs were becoming a little more elaborate. These were all on letters sent from Barry when he was in Florida for the first time. And you can see on the upper left, in the middle of the wings there, there's a bomb. And then to the right of that, it's a star in the middle of the wings. And below that is a shield. And then in the picture down there, uh, there's a, a, a drawing of a B-17. And that's what, um, that's what Barry flew when he was over in Italy. Here's a few more that were on stationery from Barry in 1943. The writing on the top logo says, prepare for combat. And then they're showing the different types of planes that they had there at the base. And the one in the middle at the top is another B-17. These are more of a generic type of military letterhead. And the one in the middle was from some USO stationery. Envelopes also had wartime slogans and designs on them. The one on the top says, idle gossip sink ships, which wasn't quite as famous as loose lips sink ships. The envelope on the bottom was about the most elaborate one in the whole collection of letters. Donald mailed this flyer to his parents and you can see at the bottom where instructions had been added on what to do in case of an air raid. It reads, the Office of Civilian Defense has devised a plan to be used in the event of an air raid warning, which will remove the audience from the auditorium. A careful check for years back shows 10 minutes to be the average time to clear the auditorium after the close of a performance. We have assurances from the authorities that there will be at least 30 minutes of warning before a hostile plane can pass over the city. If such a warning should be received, definite orders will be given through the loudspeaker system, which if followed under the direction of the ushers and police, will affect this removal without undue crowding or inconvenience. Obey instructions of those in charge. No automobiles will be allowed to move during a blackout. <clears throat> you don't really think about the possibility that planes could have attacked the middle of the United States during World War II, but communities were ready to take precautions. For example, this belonged to my mom's older brother, Robert McCoy. He was 12 and she was 10 when the United States entered the war in December 1941. They were living in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and all the kids were supposed to wear ID tags since the city was near oil refineries and considered a bombing risk. I think the tag is made out of pressed wood since all metal was being diverted to the military. The front of the tag has his ID number on it, and on the back his name is written in pencil, but it's faded so much you can barely see it. Even Christmas cards had wartime themes, and I thought this one was really pretty. This card was sent to Donald in 1942 on his first Christmas away from home in Nashville. So this concludes my presentation and I hope you enjoyed it. I'd like to thank the Historical Society for asking me to do this. And I'd also like to add a big thank you to everyone who's read the book. The response to it has just been so much more than I ever expected. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. Um, we have a couple questions we had pre submitted and I'm following in the chats too to see if there's any other comments or questions. Um, how long did it take you to work on this book when you originally were trying to compile all the letters and diaries? Um, well, I started in 2007 and I broke my leg and had to have four pins and a plate put in my ankle. So I was laid up for a long time and I decided I'd been thinking about maybe just working on my grandmother's diary because um, Special Collections has most of the copies. I've got some, because she made carbon copies to send to the different boys um, across the country. And uh, so I started doing that. And then my mom had been cleaning out my dad's office. And she said, oh, I found a couple of boxes of his letters from World War II. And I thought, well, that'll be awesome. I can stick that in there with them. And then, um, I also had a copy of his diary, which wasn't, there wasn't a whole lot in that that he kept when he was overseas. So I thought, well, I'll just kind of incorporate all that. That might be interesting. And then my cousin was cleaning out uh, his dad's stuff and found, I mean, it was a whole military locker full of letters. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of letters. And I was not as excited, but I thought, oh, you know, I, I'm going to read all those and 
and put those into. And it turned out to be just this huge, huge project. I don't know how many letters there were, but um, it's well into the hundreds, if not close to a thousand or more. So yeah, I didn't get done until uh, probably about 2017 or 18. And then I didn't know what to do with it. <laughs> And so I submitted it to uh, three different publishers, small publishers. Two were in state and one was out of state and it was rejected by all three, which didn't really surprise me because it's a lengthy, a lengthy book. Um, and then uh, I looked into self-publishing, but they all required a minimum of 150 books. And all I could think of was I don't have enough attic space to put in, you know, the 125 that don't sell. Uh, and so my husband has a, a podcast, like everybody else, on homebrewing, and he's been doing that for like 13 years. But he, he interviews homebrewers and um, craft beer people all across the world. And he was reading this book on yeast, I think. But he showed it to me and he said, he did this on Amazon and it looked great. So uh, I looked into that and I thought, well, I could. I could do that. So um, that's, that's what I did. And it is available on Amazon. And uh, also the uh, Washington County Historical Society um, has uh, 12 issues. Um, I don't know if they've sold any, but um, I did, uh, did send them 12. So they're available there too. Yeah, so you answered my next question is, where can we find this book and how much? Uh, so oh, it's available the on Amazon? Yeah, you can just go on Amazon Books and, and type in the title or my name. Uh, the paperbacks are $10 and the ebook um, is six. All right. Well, why just uh, 1942 to 45? Were there other letters or the other journals or, uh, that no. you had? No, there was um, grandmother, my grandmother get kept. She, she kind of started in about 1940, just, just a real short little diary. But it would be things like, you know, went to the store, you know, we did this at the house. It, it wasn't very detailed. And then she kind of gradually, especially when Donald was getting ready to go off, he was the first one to leave. Uh, he, she thought, well, maybe I should start writing a little bit more. And then it just got more and more detailed. And she was, um, she was fairly well educated also. Uh, she studied, I think, English um, at, it was called Grayson College in Denton, Texas. And she, she and her older brother went there for several years and then she attended the University of Arkansas for a couple of years, but um, she didn't complete her degree and instead got, of course, got married and had four boys. Uh, we got our first question from Jerry Hogan, of course. But thank you, Jerry, for submitting uh, a question in the chat. And all others, if you're watching live on Facebook or on Zoom, feel free to ask questions because uh, otherwise you're just going to hear me ask my questions. Uh, Jerry wants to know, uh, what was Susan's or what was your favorite thing about putting the book together or maybe something that you learned about the time or your family? Um, just reading... Well, reading my grandmother's diary, I, I hadn't read all of it um, because when, when the diary was, it's at special collections and when it was given there, I was working there at the time. So I just kind of glanced through it and thought it was kind of interesting. But once I really sat down and started reading it, I thought it was really interesting and, and well-written. I was impressed at how she could kind of describe things and, and what was going on. Um, it, it sounds kind of weird, but with the letters, I thought they'd be funnier because uh, my dad and, and all his brothers had this really great sense of humor. Um, but yeah, I enjoyed all of it. Uh, I could see glimpses of the da my dad that I knew, but he was still, you know, they were also young. So yeah, I, just all of it really was interesting and, and I enjoyed reading it. It was kind of like coming across buried treasure. I wish I could go back and experience the first time feeling. Well, you brought up a, good, a great point and I, I've been listening to some podcasts about 
when family members are passing and they, they give troves of pictures and diaries and letters and things like, what do you do with them? So do you have any advice for any of our viewers that may have uh, discovered or stumbled upon any of their own personal items about how they can go out about and preserving them or going about and editing and writing a book like you, like what you've done with yours? Well, they need to be organized. Uh, I have, my grandmother kept a lot of photos and documents and just from, well, from me working at Special Collections, I have a lot of those in Hollinger boxes, which are acid-free. I try to put everything in acid-free. Um, and just, it, it makes it really nice. And plus you go through it if you put it all like in chronological order, try to label them and uh, yeah, put them, put them in something that's not gonna be exposed to, to sunlight or heat or cold. Don't stick them up in the attic or the basement. <laughs> uh, we had a comment from Lynette. Thanks, Lynette. She created uh, her father's book, Radio Man, Life in the Navy Army, Armed Guard. I don't know if that's available. Lynette, you might want to add if that is something that is available to the wider audience too. But um, since this is a family history, what, what do your children think about this? Um, well, I, get, I gave them they've all got books and then my nieces and um, I know my older son has looked through it. My younger son has not because he has a job and is going to school full time. So hopefully maybe later on they'll look at it, but they were all excited about it. Yeah. I, I my, when my grandfather passed, my mother gave me his, a lot of his medals but surprisingly, I guess this was popular during World War II that they collected um, the medals or the, the artifacts of this of the enemy. So I have a lot of like swastika things that my grandpa picked <laughs> up off, off of soldiers, and I don't know what to do with them. <laughs> like, I don't want to like proudly display them in my house, but um, they are history, and it is something my grandfather wanted to pass down. So that's why I, I, I'm really fascinating in the. The, the the dilemma of like what to do with these you know not just the artifacts but like the journals and the diaries that families are going to be passing down um in in troves hopefully to keep the stories and the family heirlooms uh, yeah in. yeah my uh my husband his dad uh gave him a it's like a japanese saber or something like that i mean you know we could use it as a weapon but right now it's just up in a closet <laughs> Uh, Lynette did say her book, uh, Radio Man, Life in the Navy Armed Guard, is available on Amazon, too. Uh, okay. uh, and she also said, letters from my father with stories written out uh, when he was in his 80s and photos of his time in the Navy. Uh, and then how fast fast things got uh, in communications. Um, yeah, did, did you notice the dates on any of those letters or journals um, from when they were originally written and how long it often take to, to make it stateside? Yeah, uh, it would take probably a week or so and sometimes a little bit quicker because they would comment like, wow, this, I can't believe how fast this letter got to you. Um, yeah, it was, it was pretty quick. That's something I wish we could just teach our students today is the fact that instant communication is yes. is a, a relatively new thing that we we get upset when you don't respond to a text message nowadays and you know minutes <laughs> went back you know 60 70 years ago we were writing letters that would often take weeks but oh yeah and my dad said that that's that's what he lived for was getting a letter from home that how many total letters and diaries did you have to go through I'd say thousands of pages. It was, it was a lot. Um, I should have taken a picture and posted all the, cause I've, right now I've got them in little like shoebox things, but just, it's, it's letter after letter. There's probably, <clears throat> I don't know, close to in one box, six, 700 letters. And that's just like from maybe two years. If that Donald, Donald and my grandmother wrote the most letters. And they wrote like, I mean, she would try to write every day in the diary and then try to get a letter out every day or every couple of days. And he did too. He was real good about writing. I wonder if that meant they had a, a, a better relationship with their 
postal service uh, men and women at that time. <laughs> <laughs> well, they knew them. I know that. Yeah. that. <laughs> well, so where are you keeping all these diaries and letters now? Are you? Uh, it's, they're, just in, they're in my office. Well, yeah, and they're on my computer too. Yeah, that's, that is a lot of time. And that's the, the interesting thing about archival history is it, especially archival family history is what, what do you do with them all now <laughs> after the fact? Cause you've spent, you know, years of, of your time going through this and editing it and publishing a book, but yet you still have the artifacts and you don't want to lose them. You don't want to, even though they've been digitized, you don't just put them back, back in the attic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, they'll just they'll hang around with me for a while. All right. Uh, any other questions from our panelists, our attendees? I don't see any on Facebook right now. Any other words of wisdom that you'd like to part for anybody that might be thinking about doing something similar with their own family stories? Um, well, I, you know, I recommend Amazon. It was, it was really pretty easy to get all the information on there. And then uh, like for the front and back cover, they have templates you can use and it, it really did make it a, easy to get it published and yeah i mean otherwise i never would have probably done this so yeah, yeah i recommend them uh lots of thank yous in the comments people wanting to buy the books so that's always a plus see you're selling yeah, copies nice. of books. i can say <laughs> yeah. as a former teacher in prayer grove i'm excited to, to peruse through it to see some pictures of what prayer grove looked like during the 1940s or early yeah it's pretty fun um yeah, it's really, you know, and I, I'm just, I'm so happy that, that people are interested in it. And, um, and that's what, you know, that's my main goal was just to share this story with people and uh, everybody seems to really like it, which is great. Makes me, makes me really happy. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing a part of your family history, a local history. As, as I said at the beginning of this, uh, it's not ideal for us to be meeting via Zoom, but understandably, due to COVID, we want to make sure we're safe for all of our uh, attendees and panelists involved. But thank you, Susan, for giving us your your time on a Sunday evening to explain your book and all the work that you put into it. I, I'm personally really excited about it, and I know from reading in the chats and the comments, others are too. So thank you very much for coming and and sharing this information with us tonight. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. All right. Well, that's it for us tonight at the Washington County Historical Society with the lecture series. Uh, again, we hope that all those that are watching tunes in. Next Sunday, we will be having our annual membership meeting at one o'clock. The Zoom link has been sent out, but I think it's also via Facebook uh, as well. Jim, was there anything else that you wanted to say before we close tonight? No, just wanted to thank everyone for being here and certainly thank Susan for sharing her family history with us. All right. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you all later. Thanks. Thank you.